Hey everybody, welcome back to another video from me uh, about RenderMan for Blender. Um, it's been a little while since my last video, and in that uh, interim time, uh, RenderMan actually made a pretty big jump in versions. They came out with version 21, and this is actually the 21 version of the RenderMan for Blender exporter. And, you know, you look around, and everything on the right here looks pretty much the same. Uh, this material is different. This is something that's new exclusive to a RenderMan 21, but I think by this point, pretty much everybody out there has probably switched over and that uh, the materials actually aren't the goal of this video. What the goal of this video is this big column right here, the external rendering options. Um, a lot of the time it's actually hidden and some people don't even notice that it's there when it's sitting there kind of like this. It's just another entry. But as you can see, when you enable it and open up the bar, you see all these new controls that you've never seen before. And a lot of these actually start giving you the ability to really uh, start wielding some of RenderMan's more advanced features, uh, specifically cross-frame denoising, uh, GPU denoising, recovery, checkpoint enabling, all that, all that good stuff. And so what I want to do is just kind of take you through some of these options so you get a little bit better understanding of how they work and how they can be used on the rendering process. So the first trick, obviously, is enabling the external rendering, and basically all that's doing is just allowing these uh, options to appear. <clears throat> and then it's followed up by the nice external render button. And just a quick little uh, summarization, this external render button actually does not cause Blender to render anything. What the external render button is actually doing is it's telling the add-on to compile the uh, rib files that RenderMan uses, and then off puts them to a folder. And then depending on what you select down here, either nothing will happen or a program called Local Queue will launch. And what Local Queue is, is it's a Pixar program that kind of acts like a render farm manager for just the machine that you're on. And that will actually trigger the rendering, will actually manage the rendering. So once you hit external render, in theory, you can completely close down Blender and it has nothing more to do with the actual rendering process. Now that is uh, completely different than this box. Now when you use this box, you're actually telling Blender to manage the rendering process. And it works, it works pretty well, but as you can see, there's really no options. I mean, it's pretty simplistic. You've got four options and there's not a whole lot you can do with it. It's great for simple one-off renders, but if you want to start experimenting with some of the cooler stuff, this is where you'll find it. So to continue on, Render 2, uh, you get another option here. You get the TIFF image, which is, um, I believe in this case, it's a 8-bit I'd have to check that for sure, but uh, it's kind of there for legacy purposes. I don't know anybody that actually uses TIFF export anymore. It's kind of um, back in the day when we didn't have a lot of hard drive space and uh, high dynamic range exporting wasn't quite as important as it is now. So for all intents and purposes, you're either going to use EXR or IT. Um, IT does the same thing as it does in the upper render. It'll actually launch an IT viewer when it renders, and so you won't actually get any images saved until you save them out of IT. I know that uh, that popped up on the forum at one point, somebody wondering why they didn't see any images, and this is why. Now if you select Open EXR, then it will write images on its own. For rendering animation, you just turn that on, and then the start and end frames are actually duplicated from here. So as you can see, it both, not only is it changing here, it's changing here. So basically it's the exact same thing, just two different places to find it. Um, once again, pretty obvious that just ex exports a series of rib numbers, one for each frame. So the action, you can either generate the rib files or spool job. So generate ribs is when you basically just create the files and you store them in a hard drive. You don't actually have any kind of rendering process start. And so that's, you know, something maybe like you want to export the files and you want to render it maybe next week. Well, this would be the way to do it. If you select spool, what that's going to do is, you know, with these options, it'll either spool it to the local queue, which we also kind of talked, or it actually will spool it to Tractor, which is a Pixar produced render farm manager. Now that's for something that if you have like, say, six computers all networked together, you could run a rendering process with Tractor. Um, Tractor is way above my skill level. I don't have a render farm, and just from seeing what some of the people have had to go through to get Tractor to work, uh, it's something that I am going to stay away from and be very happy that I'm staying away from. But it is an option, and uh, for the people that have gotten it to work, it, it does work. 
So going on now into some of the more uh, unusual options, we have some options for the actual spool files that are generated. And one of the big ones, okay, so I guess I should probably explain a little bit. Um, when you actually render a process, let's just, let's just do a quick one here. Um, this is just kind of my, my generic test scene. I've been using it for months, and it works pretty well. You know, nothing, nothing fancy, nothing that's going to break anything, but it, it works pretty well. So anyway, we will generate some ribs, and we will hit external render. We will wait. And boom, there it is. So, oh, I see what it did. I actually had animation on there. No wonder it took so long. Um, so anyway, yeah, I guess I didn't intend to export an animation, but I did. So that's why uh, the gap the gap was as long as you saw there is because it was actually generating 250 ribs. <laughs> Whoops. But anyway, so we go to the output directory, which in my case is the default, the temp folder, you know, nothing too fancy. And it's right there, RenderMan for Blender. Tester 21, and we'll just we'll just delete all these because you know who needs them. They have absolutely nothing to do with what I'm trying to tell you, and they're just gonna get in the way. Oh, I suppose. Uh, lesson number one: If you're opening this, always open it as a root. Otherwise, you can't delete or do much of anything. I know some people want me to take this kind of stuff out, but I figure, you know, it's a good idea to see the mistakes I make so you don't make them too. There we go. Okay. So, we are left with three folders, a scene rib, and a scene ALF. <clears throat> and so, the rib file is the recipe, basically, for putting the image together. This is what RenderMan reads and contained in this rib are references that tie into these two folders. Uh, in the archives you can see and this is this is something that can be gone into more detail on another day but uh, you can see all of our objects are in here as individual rib files. All of our lighting, all of our cameras are all in there as, as ribs. And the render, so the render is actually run out of these ribs, but then this ALF file is what local queue actually uses to manage the rendering process. So this is, you can kind of think of this as your render script, and this is your actual scene. So anyway, that's kind of give you a little bit of background so these, these commands over here make sense. And if you open up an ALF file, what you'll see is a whole bunch of uh, crazy code like this, but everything actually has a purpose for being in here. And you know, once again, I kind of screwed up by rendering an animation so you can ignore most of this. But basically the important stuff is right here. Now this is the actual command that LocalQ is using to launch the render. And then, since I have denoising turned on, this is the command to run the denoiser. Now what you can do is you can actually insert commands into this command string that's being used. Like say if you want to use um, <clears throat> a different level of feedback or maybe you want to well enable checkpointing or different thread counts or something like that. What you can do is you can actually enter that command right here and what that will do is it'll inject this stream into the command string. So it'll show up you know somewhere somewhere right around here probably right about there it would end up. Um, and so that kind of gives you a little bit of advantage to really use some of the weirder commands of RenderMan that pretty much aren't used on any regular situation, which is why they're, they're left to be added on after the time. On custom spool name, uh, you'll notice if you go into the folder that our spool is just called spool. Well, you can change that. You can call it pretty much whatever you want, and that will show up right here. So if maybe if you run a render for a test setting. You can call it test render and then you can call it final render and these files will be named that which makes it a lot easier to keep track of what's what. So that's what those two do. <clears throat> um, with denoise post process what that does is pretty much the same thing as what it does up here. It tells the exporter to not only create the files necessary for denoising but if you're actually spooling it will generate that command inside the spool file. 
Uh, Cross-frame denoise is an expansion on denoising. You would use this on any animations, and basically what it's going to do is it's going to tell the denoiser to not only look at the actual frame that it's on, but the frame immediately preceding and following it if they're available. And what it's going to do is it's going to compare all three of those frames and come up with the best denoising solution for the actual frame in question. So if you have motion blur, depth of field, moving objects, that will improve the denoising on them because it can actually look at what's happening around it. And it's actually pretty cool. Uh, it obviously makes the denoise process longer, but you know, in the, in the long run it actually has quite a few advantages. Uh, this one for processing denoisable AOVs, that is something that is actually not... I'm not going to go into that here. That uh, actually has to do with this panel. Um, for denoising AOVs, and that's something for another video. That's um, actually a pretty complex thing, and a you know simple button that actually entails a lot of behind-the-scenes knowledge that's good to have. That uh, probably is a little bit too much for here. The next checkbox: use GPU for denoising. Uh, what that will do is it will inject a command string into the denoiser that will attempt to use a GPU on your system. Um, it doesn't always work. Uh, it's a little twitchy right now. It is getting better. But um, that's on by default, and it, it is a good thing to have. I think if um, if it doesn't have a suitable GPU, it reverts back to CPU anyway. Uh, custom denoise command, exact same thing as a render command, just this is for in injecting um, commands into the denoiser string that is used. So like if you want to do any filter overrides or any thread counts or kind of things, this is where you would do that. So checkpointing and recovery, this actually I'm going to spend the rest of my time on this one because this is actually something that's very, very easy to mis, uh, misinterpret and misunderstand exactly what it does and how you're supposed to use it. So um, with version 20, RenderMan came out with an interesting feature where you can save periodic images during the course of rendering as checkpoints. <clears throat> and so if you were to enable this, you can see that the checkpoint methods can be either seconds, you know, hours, days, etc., etc., etc. And what that's telling it is that, say, we have it set at 60 seconds. What that's telling the renderer is that every 60 seconds, I'm going to spit out an image. And I'm going to continue rendering at this time. And so what you can do, actually, is that, say, your render takes 10 minutes, you'll see 10 images that actually show the progression of how the render went from beginning and super noisy to you know end and super clear and it allow you to kind of step through and watch the progress why would you want to use this um, one of the big areas they say that would be helpful <clears throat> is for doing like an overnight quality check say you've got your scene done and you want to see how it's going but you don't want to do a full render while well, you set it to run overnight you set it to checkpoint after say maybe eight hours and when you come in in the morning, you can see where the image is at while well, the render is still progressing. So if the image isn't what, if there's something wrong with the render, like maybe a light got turned off, you can stop the render without having to wait for it to complete its entire cycle, which, you know, on some of these heavier renders can take 24, 36 hours. And knowing that there's something wrong after 8 and stopping it is you know, pretty advantageous. Tied in with exactly how often to save is also a limit. Now what this limit does is it will actually terminate a rendering early. So say you have it set to 256 samples and you set a limit to two hours. Now after two hours the rendering is going to stop regardless of whether or not it hit that sample limit or not. It may have only hit 64 samples, but in any case it's going to stop rendering and that is basically will be saved as a checkpoint as well. Now what that is where the recovery comes in. If you do that limit to stop a render, what you can do is you can come back in here and you can restart that render. So you'll have to do the rib export again. Um, at some point that might be a different system, but right now you'll have to do the rib export again. And what you do is you click this to enable recovery and you hit render. What should happen is that it will pick up that partial two hour render and continue it. So, you know, if it takes 12 hours total and you've already done two hours, then in 10 hours you should get your final image. Uh, that's an important thing to denote is that recovery only works when you have a checkpoint available to use. So you, at some point you will have had to render out a number of checkpoints 
and used an early termination to get recovery to work. If the rendering process finishes, if it hits this 256 samples, it's going to stop and that image will not be recover recoverable because there's really nothing to recover. That being said, there is a little catch to that, and that's this option right here. If you enable this, what it will do is that when it hits that 256 samples, it will save out the final image, but that image will be a checkpoint. Um, the checkpoints, if you look at them, you can see that they have a larger data size than your final images, and the reason is is it saves a number of data paths inside that the recoverer uses. And normally when it hits the final image, it erases all those extra channels. And what this checkbox will do is basically tell it to keep those extra channels around. Why would you do that? Well, if you hit your 256, you go in and you look, and it's still kind of noisy. You don't like it. What you can do is you can come back in here. You can change your samples maybe to 512, do a recovery, and it should pick up on that. Even though the previous renderer completely finished, as long as it has those checkpoint data streams in there, it should be able to recover. So like I said, that's, that's a lot of information to digest on exactly how this works. Um, it's a very powerful system, but like I said, it's, it's specific. It only works in certain circumstances, and it's, in, it's important to understand what those are, especially the recovery. I see a lot of confusion about that on the forums on exactly how it's used, and that's, that's how Pixar intended for it to be used was to resume a checkpoint and finish it up. And so that is pretty much an overview of what the external renderer can do. Like I said, it's it's a lot more advanced. You get access to cross-frame denoising, GPU denoising, um, AOV denoising if you decide to take it. You can do custom spool names, custom render commands, custom denoise commands, etc., um, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Checkpointing, recovery. Um, it's where all the cool stuff hangs out. And I'll be honest, I rarely ever use internal rendering now. For the most part, all I do is external rendering, just because it seems much more, I don't know, cool, maybe, is the right word? Yeah, it's it's cool to use external rendering. That's what the big boys use. But anyway, um, so that's a quick overview of external rendering, even though it wasn't that quick. And I hope uh, that works for you. Um, coming up, I hopefully am going to be doing a video on the smoke simulator. I know there's a lot of questions on that, on exactly how that works. A uh, short thing to say is that it works really, really well if you do the steps right. <laughs> so anyway, uh, stay tuned for that video. And in the meantime, this is John signing off with the Render Man for Blender, how to use the external renderer.